So hello everyone and welcome to our second revolutionizing healthcare session. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. Uh, I handle communications for the Van der Schaar lab and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, we're also joined by Mihaila van der Schaar, um, who will be giving a presentation and Q&A today. And our co-moderator for today's session is Alex Chan, who's one of today's, who is one of our lab's PhD students. Uh, so to give you an idea of the purpose behind this session and why we're doing it this way, um, as I think you'll remember that last time we kind of established that our shared goal should be to improve healthcare together by combining the perspectives and issues and needs of clinicians with the abilities of machine learning experts to come up with solutions for these problems. But obviously this is a huge conceptual and logistical challenge to face. So our goal really with this session is to try and define that challenge to introduce a unified framework for the methods and techniques and structures for machine learning for healthcare. And this is something that is really shaped by years of discussions that we've had with uh, our collaborative clinicians, but kind of more specifically or in a more focused way recently with some one-on-one -on -one interviews we've had with some of these clinicians. Um, so we'll be introducing this framework in today's session and also hoping to discuss and improve this framework in order to ensure that it reflects the perspectives of you, the clinicians. So in terms of how this breaks down format wise, um, we're going to start with a presentation that features the interviews that we've had with clinicians recently. And this will also have an ex kind of explanations throughout by Mihaila about how these interviews have informed and shaped the framework that we'll be presenting. And then we're going to go into a Q&A and discussion session of, about this new framework, which will last about 20 minutes. And our hope is that you'll provide your questions and ideas and feedback on this framework. So we'd like to ask you to post any questions that you have um, either during, um, especially during really, or after the presentation into the Zoom chat. Um, please address it to everyone instead of direct messaging. And we'd like to limit questions and feedback to practicing clinicians, if that's possible, because you are our intended audience for these sessions. And we'd like to keep each question to one minute so that we can get through as many of them as possible. We do hope to wrap up at about five past five. Um, if you do have to drop off a little early, please don't worry because you can catch the session on YouTube when we upload it either later today or tomorrow. Um, so without further ado, please let me set up uh, Mihaila's presentation. We did decide to pre-record this because it is 45 minutes long and we didn't want to take any risks with uh, technical issues or anything like that. Hello, and welcome to Revolutionizing Healthcare 2. Today, I would like to describe how we can build together a unifying framework for machine learning in healthcare. The problem that we would like to address is a lack of a cohesive plan, a cohesive framework to guide the development of a system of mutually supportive machine learning tools for revolutionizing healthcare. Another challenge we would like to address is the fact that there are multiple interrelated and complex healthcare areas that could benefit from the use of machine learning. But instead of addressing one problem at a time in a piecemeal fashion, we need a holistic unified solution. So the process that I would like to propose is to start by defining together common and solvable problems in healthcare ranging from those facing individuals to system-wide issues. Then determine how these problems can be addressed through machine learning and the appropriate approaches or methods to do so. Finally, we can develop a broad unifying framework for classifying these problems in a way that makes sense from both the medical as well as the machine learning perspective and use this framework to help focus future work by us and hopefully many others towards revolutionizing healthcare. We have had over the past month a series of in-depth discussions with six clinicians. We would like to thank them for their time and insight that have guided us in developing this framework. We would like to introduce them to you now. 
So I'm, uh, I'm Maxime Kennison. I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at UCLA. So my name is David Cox. I'm a consultant neonatologist. And for people who don't know, that's someone who looks after the care of newborn babies when they're sick. And I work at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. So that's a large trust in London. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. Uh, my specialization is internal medicine with a special interest in women's health. I'm Brent Urshoff. I'm an anesthesiologist at the University of California, Los Angeles. And I specialize in anesthesiology, and my subspecialty is in anesthesiology for liver transplantation. I'm David McCartney, so I work two days as a, as a GP and then work the rest of the week at the University in Oxford, mostly within, within the medical school, but also um, doing some research within the Department of Primary Care. I'm uh, Henk van Wiert and I'm a general practitioner in Amsterdam. I've done uh, patients for about uh, 30 years and now since the last eight years, I've become, a, no, in 10 years, I've become a professor of uh, general practice at the Amsterdam Medical Center. On the basis of these discussions, I've developed the following framework that I would like to propose to you to think about these various problems. This framework has two dimensions. One is focus-oriented, focused either on the patient or on the clinician or healthcare professional. The other is scale-oriented, focus on the individual clinician or the entire healthcare system. One of the areas that I'd like to start with is that that is focused on the patient and is aimed at supporting the clinician assisting and making decisions on behalf of the patient in front of them. We call this new area bespoke medicine. Let us start with our discussions with the clinician. A therapy is now very uh, also a very raw therapy because we all treat people with the same condition in the same way uh, but the the biological systems of all those patients are not the same so uh, and uh, let's let's stand alone the psychological system but anyway also the biological system isn't so i think we need much more diversification in our therapy so a more personalized approach to, uh, to patients. Uh, and there, of course, uh, data can help, can be very helpful. Today, the, uh, the, the, clinical, the clinical decision support system that are existing are extremely uh, rudimentary. They exist, they are usually a rule-based algorithm where you have like a, a few criteria that leads to a decision tree with two, three or four uh, uh, options for decision making. Uh, and obviously, uh, life and uh, biological science is much more complex than these very simple clinical decision support tools that are based on the uh, algorithm. I see lots of people, you know, how many people do I see in a day probably speak to 60, 70 people in a day on some days. Sometimes it's not always that many, maybe 30, 40. Um, but many of those will have symptoms where I am thinking they won't always be thinking, but I will be thinking in the back of my mind, could this be cancer? Um, and having some some tool to be able to even just reassure myself that actually it's very unlikely that that this could be cancer um, would be would be really useful or actually well the possibility is is there so actually the next step would be probably to think about an endoscopy or a colonoscopy or some kind of, of other imaging and actually you're at a point with this patient's age risk factors whatever else it might be that you need a bit of additional information here to be able to to be able to fully fully make that decision you know, a lot of these kind of simple decisions. So suppose there was a system that told me within the next 10 minutes, there's a X percent probability that the patient's blood pressure is going to drop below 65, a map of six, a mean arterial pressure of 65. And something like that's already been, you know, developed. You know, the, the question really is, you know, why is that information necessarily helpful to me? Um, I could always do something to make somebody's blood pressure higher. Why don't I just give a drug continuously during the case to make their blood pressure above 65 under any situation? 
Um, so, you know, the, because and their answer why not is because giving those medications to raise the blood pressure can have other negative consequences. I'm not only trying to, my only goal is not just to prevent hypotension, it's to optimize some other outcome that I might not even know about. And there might be competing risks with, you know, different outcome measures. So if I would have, let's say, a 45-year-old man who has good cholesterol and a normal electrocardiogram, um, I would assume that perhaps it's not a problem that would lead to a heart attack. But um, this is not really precise. So that's where I would help. I would, it would help for me to have like a quick uh, analysis of how other 45-year-old men in the, all the published medical literature have done and what would be the chance I had to say, you know, this guy has a chance of 10% of having a heart attack or of 12% or whatever it is. So that would certainly be helpful to have that aggregate of medical knowledge at my fingertips when I see an actual patient. It would be nice, you know, to kind of press a button or choose a screen and have uh, um, all that analysis at my disposal. I think what would be helpful is if you could help, you know, give potentially probabilities or of, of various outcomes with different treatment choices for a patient um, with, you know, with similar covariates as yours. The big problem in general practice, of course, is to reach a diagnosis. It's not so much a therapeutical uh, problem. It's more the problem of, of detecting and diagnosing disease. Um, and the main line, the bottom line, is that we do it in the same way as I have been teached when I was at medical school. And that's really, that's more than 40 years ago. Um, and not much changed since that time, because we all knew the symptoms of uh, serious diseases. Um, and what, uh, and there, there, there has been no new symptoms the last 40 or 50 years, uh, at least not where I'm aware of. Uh, and the only thing that uh, that really changed is that we were we were better in in, in uh, predicting the certainty of which you could say that somebody has certain disease or not. So the 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 symptoms and the combination of symptoms became quantified, and I think that's the main uh, progress medicine or, or general practice made in detecting people with a serious disease. I think there's so much data out there right now um, that is beyond what a human is able to synthesize and, and learn about. So, you know, trends in data, different types of data stream, imaging data that all may have useful information. So I think it's just exciting that these types of data can be, you know, can help inform me into making decisions. So the, the idea would be to go to a clinical decision support system that are going to be more complex and are going to look at patients holistically and provide uh, options for physicians to choose. And these options are going to be based on the expected outcome of the intervention that would be suggested, right? So for example, you have a patient with a breast cancer and uh, based on the phenotype of the patient, based on more granular information that could even include the genes of the patient, um, machine learning algorithm would be able to suggest different treatments, different chemotherapy, based on the uh, uh, treatment options would give the expected outcome, and then the clinician would choose. You still need to probably lead um, to leave the uh, the clinicians have a choice in the uh, in the decision making. I think it would be you know very helpful to be able to identify cluster of patients where I can. A machine can help me focus on what types of data might be more important for this type of patient. I think GP really characterizes the word uncertainty. Every day, every clinic, there is huge amounts of, of um, uncertainty. Um, what's going on here? Uh, what's the diagnosis? What do I need to worry about? What might I miss? Um, those are the things that you're thinking about all the time every time you speak to a patient, that you see a patient. And what information that you can gather, which will help you reach some degree of certainty, or at least as much certainty as you can at that point in time with the information you have available. You're then thinking about actually, is this enough information? Have I got the information here that I need to be able to make a decision about where we go from here? 
um, or are there some more things that are needed? And if there are more things that are needed, what's the time scale on which those things are needed? Um, so if somebody perhaps needs, uh, you know, you think actually we need some blood tests to work out a bit more about what's going on, you know, what the likelihood of it being something serious, perhaps a, a cancer, um, uh, what, what's the next step? And if they do need blood tests, if they need other investigations, do they need them now? Do they need them this instant? Or actually, is it okay if they have them tomorrow or next week and use that information to feed in a bit later down the line? And that time scale really depends on um, what the problem is you're worried about? What are you thinking about? What's the you know, what's the worst this could be? Essentially, my day is made up of a whole heap of different types of decisions, um, which I suppose you could compartmentalise into kind of three broad categories. So part of it is about planning care for a baby and particularly for counselling parents. And this can be done either before a baby's born, where there are clearly far more unknowns, or it can be done when a baby's born and we have a lot more information because we can actually see the baby and we can get some of the diagnostics from that. Then what you'd call the kind of day-to-day -day clinical diagnostics and management, where we're looking at a baby's care who's in front of us and making decisions which will affect the very near future or the slightly longer term future. And that can be decision making on uh, some things which are fairly standardised, so we can work from protocols. And they're what you'd call the kind of foreseeable decisions and working with emergencies, so the unforeseen decisions. And so an idea of a foreseeable or a planned decision would be, OK, this baby is now three days old. When do I start increasing the amount of milk that they're getting into the tummy versus when do we change the feed volume that they're getting intravenously, et cetera. So you're balancing that kind of step in the next stage of their care when a baby is progressing well. An idea of a less foreseeable, so an unforeseen or an emergency decision would be, okay, this baby looks sick, so when do I start antibiotics? When do I think this is infection versus a different cause? When do I order a chest x-ray because they've had a deterioration with their breathing? As you can see from these conversations, medicine is hard. As Osler said, it is an art. And the reason it is an art is because individuals are complex. They have different genetic backgrounds, environmental exposures, lifestyles, histories and interventions. And these are expressed as different risks, different risks over time, variation in symptoms, different health and disease trajectories, different responses to treatment, etc. So we would like to go beyond personalized medicine which is the state of the art. Beyond personalized, individualized or precision medicine, which views individuals on the basis of some fixed pattern, which is defined on the basis of a limited pre-selected numbers of factors. Bespoke medicine goes further by creating patterns for individuals on the basis of all the information that is available. It updates and adapts these patterns as new information becomes available. It does so by incorporating the effects of aging, lifestyle changes, onset and evolution of conditions, of morbidities and comorbidities, as well as the progress of a patient through a course of a treatment or a series of treatments. How can we do all this? Using machine learning, of course. Machine learning can turn medicine from an art into a science. Bespoke medicine will make full use of the power of machine learning and the available data to create a dynamic and holistic view of the individual in a way that is presently impossible. A holistic patient view will be possible in this way. This will be a broad view based on multiple competing risks over time and it will not only look at the patient at the current moment in time, it will integrate the entire past history of the patient and will make predictions not only for the immediate future, but long into the future, thereby providing a lifetime of care. A few tools and approaches that bespoke medicine can enable are, first, when a patient is currently going to a clinician 
as you have heard in our conversations, a handful of risk scores are available for the patient in, at hand. However, bespoke medicine can enable an entire broad spectrum of such risks, including competing risks, as well as an understanding of how these risks are going to evolve over time and which ones are going to be most important and when. It will also enable to identify better personalized screening and monitoring for the patient at hand. It will provide recommendations as to what information to acquire using what type of modality or test and when, as well as how to monitor a patient as the symptoms or a particular disease is unraveling. Machine learning can also enable better bespoke diagnostic support for the particular patient. It can provide not only risk scores that are static, but rather entire longitudinal disease trajectories for the patient. Also, it can provide recommendations that are individualized to this patient on which treatments are most effective and when. Well. It can learn from the available data from one disease, but it can generalize and provide lessons that transcend one particular disease and provide lessons for many other diseases as well. It could be that for one particular disease, we have very highly curated, very high quality data, and we can learn very effectively. However, the tools that we developed on the basis of this disease could be useful for other diseases as well. So there is an opportunity to learn in a comprehensive way. The clinical problems that bespoke medicine can address include understanding physiology and symptoms. By using data, we can discover systematically interactions among various factors and various factors over time. We can better quantify disease, identify disease states, duration in these states, what is the probability to transit to a new state and when, what are events that may show that a transition to a net state is imminent, etc. This will also enable us to do early diagnosis of disease. Unlike current approaches to phenotyping, which tend to be static, bespoke medicine can enable dynamic phenotyping and forecasting empowered by machine learning. Also, we are not only able to make predictions and predictions over time, we can also discover causal pathways, thereby being able to new, make new discoveries and have better understanding of disease progression mechanisms. Finally, we can understand individualized effects of treatment for the patient at hand and do counterfactual scenario analysis. What will happen if I would treat this patient in a particular way at a particular moment in time, or I would decide to use a different treatment at another moment in time. This enables us to understand and estimate individual variation in efficacy, side effects, dosage, and interactions among different treatments for the patient at hand. But bespoke medicine is not possible without providing recommendations that can truly empower clinicians. Let us understand what clinicians require from machine learning in, able to, in order to be able to do so. I think, you know, the human brain is obviously pretty impressive. You know, somehow we're making these decisions because we're incorporating a lot of knowledge that we know about the biology and things that we can't even describe in words that are meaningful, even though we get it wrong sometimes. I think a lot of times we get it right. And I think a way to kind of use the machine learning information along with ours so that we understand how it's maybe coming up with these decisions so that we can make a better decision and not necessarily throw out what the clinician knows and just say what a machine says. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, there's clearly certain things that the human can do right now better than a machine on its own. And is there a way to um, bring them 
together. So maybe the explainability and uncertainty of predictions would be helpful. There's plenty of opportunity to try to keep up with the times, but it's becoming harder and harder. And, um, you know, I think nothing is better illustrated as far as example as the situation with COVID, right? I mean, this is a new virus that came upon us some months ago. And all of us doctors have been heavily reading, voraciously reading, trying to figure out how to take care of our patients. And it's not always easy. You know, some of these studies are not peer reviewed. The first uh, batch that came from China was questionable on many levels. So, um, so that's where I think machine learning has a great opportunity to help us in sorting out and aggregating um, these multiple studies that come out. Um, that uh, you know, if I'm if I work full work days, I have a, it's impossible for me to read everything that's uh, uh, published on the topic. So, um, so managing the information that comes at us, I think, would be easier if we have, you know, machine learning tools at our disposal. Well, I would prefer support with, with things that don't happen, happen very uh, uh, often because I will know those. Because things that uh, can, can be, of which you can be quite certain and where it is also uh, quite, um, well, well, there's evidence for the, for the treatment you have to provide. Because if, if there's no evidence for any treatment I can provide, there's no need in warning me. Saying like there's a, a certain prob there's a probability that this patient's going to have a blood pressure less than 65. How certain is that? Uh, how certain is that prediction? And what is the risk of treating it if they're wrong? How far below 65 are we going? What if it's 64? Is that really a big deal or not? So interpretations of statistics, I think, is, is the challenge. I think what would be helpful is almost having machine learning, which also acts as a learning tool, which not only gives its verdict, but also gives you the resource that it's had as to kind of where it's gone to evaluate that idea or build those statistics. So it brings you up with a decision support formula in some way or an output in some way but also lets you see the stuff that's gone into it so yourself if you're keen to actually understand more you can see what it's referencing you can see what's gone into the black box and the output um those kind of things i think would be um for me as a clinician they'd help me kind of trust the machine learning and use it more you have different kinds of gps and different kinds of doctors and they all have a preference for the way they are guided through their consultations well, I, I don't mind if there comes a pop-up, if it's small enough for me, <laughs> a small pop-up telling me, look out, because this patient might have, well, name it, or look out, this patient is known as atrial fibrillation, you should, you should give them a therapy for that. It's okay. And what I really need at that moment is that the warning I get is a correct warning. There are no mistakes allowed here. Um, because un until now, many systems have uh, have mistakes, and it are not just the the programs that are mistaken, but also the files of the doctors themselves, because they don't write the things up properly. And if you don't if you don't have a, have a good file, you know, then you get garbage in, garbage out. So then al also your system will not work. Easy to use is really important, um, and something that integrates with the clinical system. Um, is essential. If it doesn't integrate with the clinical system, then that makes it much harder to use. Um, and if you're having to go to some external system logistically within a consultation that is quite time limited as it is, it often doesn't happen. I think as clinicians, we get blinded by our own bias. And we find that a lot uh, in medicine, where one bad experience therefore taints our decision making going forward one thing that has worked particularly well we try again regardless of the fact that actually it makes no sense in a cold light of day evaluation and this is where i think machine learning will help and part of it might be with providing statistics or a little nudge in the right way to kind of kind of say that okay this is on your day-to-day -day decision making i don't know for me 90 percent of the antibiotic uh, babies that you start on antibiotics have been blood culture negative or haven't had any proven microbiology, maybe you're using too many. Or babies with a lack of heart rate variability 
actually this is a huge factor which states that they have infection. Look at this, this is an early marker for potential sepsis. Based on these conversations, it is clear that machine learning will never replace clinicians. However, it can empower clinicians. And one way to do so is by using machine learning to build personalized assistance to support clinicians. Since different clinicians have different needs, different ways of practicing medicine, and see different patients in different types of healthcare ecosystems, the machine learning assistance shouldn't be one size fits all. They should be personalized to the specific needs of the clinician and the medical practice in which they operate. Machine learning also should provide recommendations that are interpretable, explainable, and trustworthy to clinicians. Finally, it is my belief that machine learning can promote multidisciplinary clinical contributions by teams of clinicians. So it can not only empower one particular clinician at a time, but be, but be able to promote teams of clinicians that can work and interact together effectively to better treat a particular patient. So this brings me to the next topic in our framework, that of systems, pathways, and processes that can enable an entire healthcare system to operate more effectively. Let us hear what the clinicians had to say about this. Today, when you are a clinician taking care of patients at the bedside on a day-to-day -day basis, we, we are reaching a point where the information there is information overload and the information is highly fragmented. Uh, there is redundancy in the information and fragmentation in the information. And the, uh, and the, the information is overwhelming for clinicians. That's something that's been induced a lot by the electronic medical record. So a lot of information is actually lost in the medical record. Uh, the ability of the human brain to process a uh, very large volume of information uh, is not optimal. Uh, and we, we miss in the way we process information a lot of uh, relevant uh, points. And I, I think that's where there is a, a critical need actually to help us uh, consolidate this information, help us make the right decision uh, in the midst of this uh, fragmented, uh, redundant, and overwhelming uh, information. Um, so I, I think that that we, well, as general practitioners, we, we have an amount of, of data, um, not well categorized, not well uh, being taken care of, uncured. It's, it's a, a really a big mess, but the data are there. And uh, well, until a few years, there was nothing you could do with those data. And I think now the, the, progr the progress in, uh, uh, in, in mainly in artificial intelligence methods are that we can, we can use those data. I think that we should start using our data in a, in a good way. And that needs a lot of data uh, uh, managing on beforehand, before you can start using those data. But we, 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 we must start having a look at our, our data. Perhaps uh, interfacing uh, your systems with our electronic medical records would be helpful. Because as Mihaela knows, um, looking at data from electronic medical records is very frustrating. There's a lot of information that can be missing. Um, a lot of data that's not as specific as you would like it to be so that you can use your own models. So I think that that's an area of improvement. A lot of people get asked the same questions um, and there's this kind of similar guidelines for the average patient. And I think, you know, we don't necessarily have time to ask every single question that we want. Um, I think, you know, it would be helpful to have, uh, you know, be able to better uh, get a, a, a subset of questions that are better asked for a certain group of patients and, and learn, you know, and help learn what tests are important for a specific quest, uh, uh, patient population. Going to protocolized medicine would ensure that at least you have consistency in how care is delivered from one patient to the other with the same disease. The problem with this is that this is one size fits all. And every one of us, we are different. 
So what you want to do is to actually increase the viability in care. But you want this viability in care not to be centered on the physician or the hospital, but to be centered on the patient. Protocolized care is going to help decrease viability centered on the physician or on the hospital. Precision medicine, machine learning, artificial intelligence is going to increase the viability centered on the patient and is going to reconcile protocolized medicine with personalized medicine. There's this, the ERAS protocols in, in surgery and anesthesia. These are enhanced recovery protocols where you know you try to accomplish certain things uh, um, during an anesthetic. So for example, minimizing fluids, uh, main, you know, uh, avoiding opioids if necessary. So there's these kind of set of things that you're supposed to do and they're, they're almost become quality measures. And you know, the, on, on average, it's been shown that if you do some of these things, it will improve outcomes. But what would I, what would be ideal is you actually have a, a better, better protocol or policy for the individual patient. And so I think, you know, this idea of one size fit all in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, a treatment regimen is, you know, can be detrimental, even if um, on average, it actually leads to better outcomes across the board. Everything that I do essentially could be streamlined or made more robust by the support in terms of everything from staff management, road planning, from identifying cot capacity in the network in terms of how we deal with our local hospitals, where we can flag up which babies should be uh, applicable for earlier discharge, where you can flag up staffing deficiencies. So you might need to kind of move staff from one hospital to another to support kind of regional service. Um, looking at provision of equipment so we can look about babies in different hospitals even move around ventilators and things to make sure the right equipment is in the right place there is huge log logistical kind of a need for the kind of logistical increased kind of capability um, which we don't have it's it's endless and the last set of decisions is about systems logistics so this is about, okay, so we are a level three unit. So we are a referral hospital from other hospitals around. How full is our unit? Can we offer optimal management to accept another baby who needs our care? When do we need to transfer babies to the local hospitals? How do we manage our staff to make sure we can continue to do this effectively? There is actually a tremendous viability in how physicians approach the same problem. Um, and so, for example, you have one patient with a specific phenotype and a specific disease, and you have 10 physicians in front of this patient, it's very likely that amongst the 10 physicians, there's going to be a distribution of maybe three or four different approaches on how to treat this specific patient. And so, uh, and today that's one of the main issues, is the viability in decision making in physicians. Um, the, the ideal state would be that you'd have uh, one patient with the uh, exact same phenotype and the same disease, 10 physicians, and the 10 physicians would deliver the same exact treatment, and this treatment would be the best treatment for the, for the patient. Uh, the, the reality, it's not uh, the, way, the way it's working. There is also another problem is that there is a, a lot of habits in how physicians deliver care. For example, you take the, uh, 10 patients with uh, the same disease, but uh, 10 different phenotypes, and you have one physician, it's very likely that the same physician is going to deliver the same treatment to these uh, 10 different patients. So where I see the opportunities in the, in the future is that you probably want to decrease the viability in care that's uh, centered on the physician, but you want to increase the viability in care that's centered on the patients. So it is the goal of this particular area to use machine learning to improve healthcare systems pathways and processes such that every patient can receive the best possible care. So the focus will be on personalized best care for this particular patient, but care that is best independent of the venue where it is delivered, thereby eliminating the unnecessary and undesirable variation in care. Care that it is cost-effective as well as has the highest efficacy for every patient. Machine learning can enable this by integrating the available data from a vast, vast array of interconnected sources to produce actionable intelligence that will inform 
all components of the healthcare system, from the delivery of information and recommendations to providers and patients, to the better planning and allocation of resources, and everything in between. This can also enable better cooperation, interaction, and learning across the different units of a healthcare system, but also between the healthcare systems across a particular region, country, or even across countries. This brings us to population health and public health policy. Let us see what the clinicians have to say about this. If you think in terms of population health, if the goal is not to focus only on like a single patient with a single physician at a given time, but to, to, to focus on, on health in general at the population level, you would argue that any even very little incremental gain that you make is going to have a huge impact on the whole population. If you can improve the health of 1% of the population, you're improving the health of millions and millions of people. So it may be that uh, this uh, incremental gain may not feel that meaningful on the one-to-one -one patient to physician interaction, but have a tremendous gain at the uh, population health level. Uh, the question is, where do you set the bar when you develop this kind of tools, right? I would say that uh, the same way you should not shoot for the ideal system right away. You have to be meaningful in how you, you have to be targeted in how you develop the system. You have to identify a disease that can be reasonably improved uh, by using the system. Again, I think cancer, cardiovascular disease, acute care medicine are places where we know the outcome can be improved and we know that the decision making is extremely viable and any incremental gain in decision making would be a would be a, a, a good outcome i think that there is still in medicine a huge challenge in working out when a guideline becomes a rule and actually that is something where you get far more nuance. The further you get up that medical ladder, the more experience you get, you work out when to apply a guideline or when personal circumstances um, dictate otherwise. So I think you do get better, but you still, every clinician has blind spots with that. Machine learning can discover and disentangle population risk and personalize those risks to various individuals. So population health and public health policy can be transformed by machine learning. Machine learning can produce data-driven guidelines, protocols, and standards, and it can do so in a much more effective way than the current way in which these guidelines are determined. Also, it can better stratify patients such that screening programs, for instance, are performed in a much more effective and cost-effective way by determining who to screen, when to screen them, using what modality screen to screen them, as well as how often to screen them. This is also pertinent for treatment and also in the era of COVID-19 for vaccination. We can determine who should be vaccinated or have access to a particular type of treatment and when. And how should access to vaccines of treatments be prioritized? Another area is that of determining access to scarce resources. For instance, identifying how can we best allocate scarce organs for transplants. Machine learning can also facilitate cross-country learning and interventions. And this is an important uh, topic, especially now in the era of COVID-19. It is currently a missed opportunity in this pandemic not to use the wealth of data that is available across the different locations and across the different countries to learn from each other to enable better treatment of COVID-19 patients. The data available, the different solutions provided by clinicians in different countries, and with the use of machine learning, we can learn important lessons that can be transformative in the era of COVID-19. In summary, I believe that together we can catalyze a revolution in healthcare. We can move from current existing approaches into next generation healthcare 
I'm going to call that learning engines for healthcare. We are going to move from the current electronic health records and other such systems, which are static, passive, and isolated displays of information into an environment where we can provide dynamic, active, and individualized display of information. Also, not only information, recommendations that are context dependent. They are specialized for the patient in front of the clinician and also take into consideration the unique needs and specialty of the attending clinician. Recommendations that are also holistic and consider the entire characteristics and history of the patient. We are not only going to issue recommendations, but these recommendations are going to be supported by interpretations and uncertainty estimates, such, as, such that the clinicians, as well as patients, are empowered by them. Hence, unlike the current systems, which are mainly used by clinicians, in the future, learning engines for healthcare will empower all stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem clinicians, healthcare professionals, patients, managers, researchers. So we are moving from a current passive one size fits all of the current electronic health records into a next generation that is active and bespoke for the different users of the learning engines for healthcare and their unique needs. In this way, the core functionality will move from the current way in which electronic health records are used, which are merely data storage and presentation, into a next generation system, which not only do data storage and presentations, but also can provide insights, actionable intelligence, and decision support, and also enable and empower clinical research. So in this way, we are moving from the current maps to ways. So like currently, if I give you a map of San Francisco, this will allow you to make a route from A to B, but it doesn't tell you if that is a good route at this hour of the day, whether the streets are one way in certain times of the day, what to do if there is a lot of traffic, and what to do if the street is closed for construction. Waze is able to do all these things and enables the different drivers to collaborate with each other to discover this information. In a similar way, we are moving from the current passive electronic health records into learning engines for healthcare, thereby enabling and fueling the healthcare revolution. Okay, so uh, now it is time for our Q&A session. And we actually already have a pretty full complement of questions, um, pretty much enough for the remainder of the session, I think. So probably no need to actually post any further questions into the Zoom chat at this point. Um, and the what will happen now is basically I'll call on a few of you to ask your questions and I will ask you to unmute yourself. Um, please just introduce yourself. Um, you know, your name, your location, and your specialization. And please, please try to keep your questions to one minute, if at all possible. So I believe um, the first question that we have is actually from Venkat. And Venkat, um, you, I think, may have asked a few questions. So can I just ask you to maybe choose, pick one of those questions um, and stick with that, if at all possible. Thank you, Mihaela and Nick. I am a neurodevelopmental pediatrician very close to Cambridge. I work in Cambridge here in Peterborough. My question is that uh, I deal with the individual patients as well as the whole population. I'm interested in predicting uh, biopsychosocial adverse outcomes in the long term based on uh, various information we have and also choosing the right tools to get there. Uh, do you think we can uh, make it work? And what data should I be collecting now? And how can I help? 
So thank you very much first to all of you for making time in your precious schedule to, to, to meet with us and discuss with us. And thank you, Venkat, uh, to you for putting this question. So I think uh, the issue that I saw also going in the chat is really what data should I have to make some of these um, advancements possible and to let machine learning be truly powerful. Um, it is really my belief that we should be able to learn from a variety of data sources, inclusively messy data, data that may be missing and possibly data from a variety of locations, not only one location, but integrate data from multiple locations, even though these different locations may be different in the way they practice medicine or the type of patients they see. And to be completely honest, I think that this is such an important issue to discuss together, both what data sources are available, but also from our side, the machine learners, to tell you what is really state of the art and what we can do today and what we hope to do tomorrow and what we think it may be impossible to do, such that you can guide us better as to how to use this data, as well as maybe inform you how to let's say acquire better data sources. So maybe that by itself should be a discussion of a subsequent session. But I think that we could learn on the basis of whatever data you have available right now, as long as this data is of sufficient quality, uh, doesn't need to be of perfect quality, but sufficient quality and we have sufficient number of patients to learn from. That being said, I introduced a line in this presentation where I said, at times there may be data sources that there may be specialties that have fantastic data for whatever reason, maybe because there are uh, good registries that are collecting them or your organization collects them for a particular disease, for instance, transplantation. Maybe we can learn on the basis of some data and develop tools which can then be retrained for a new specialty, but they can be at least validated in one context and then we can see the value of it on another. So to make a long story short, I think that it would be, a, I, I will make sure to organize a session just about data, data sources and talk about what machine learning can do in that regard. And a final, final thing, sorry, just the question is too good to miss the opportunity. I think it's also an opportunity to teach us whether other data is required, whether the data we have is enough does it provide sufficient um, decision? Can we build decision support systems that are useful on the basis of this data? Or we need to collect new data? And the question is what? But my feeling so far is that already there is quite a lot of high quality data as Hank is saying in the presentation that he made. And like he says, we, we have data. We should try to use whatever data we have and do the best with the data we have before we go and invest, I don't know how much money and get new data. So I think understanding the value of information and what these machine learning models can do based on current data, whatever it is and how good it is, will be a first step in my opinion. But thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think the next question was actually going to be from uh, Thomas Daniels, but he may or may not have uh, dropped off the call at this point. So I'll put that until last. And um, if if he still hasn't joined, I'll I'll read it out from the chat. Um, so next, uh, if we could go to David Cox, and David is actually, as you will have seen, um, one of the clinicians who kindly volunteered his time to talk to us. So hi, Mahala, hi Nick. Uh, lovely presentation. Thank you very much. It was just on the theme of empowering clinicians. Um, is it worth discussing how we can try and maximize clinician involvement in the building of machine learning tools? Because my, my hypothesis is that the more clinicians we can get involved in the design, the better the product in terms of both for the clinician use and for their understanding. And once we get that, I think in terms of deploying these solutions, we'll probably that's the way we'll get to best deployment. So, so thank you, David, both for participating in our pre-session and now, and for this question. So I completely agree. Part of the reason we started this engagement sessions is to try to involve you, the clinicians, as much as possible in defining the problem, defining the tools that you think will be useful, defining the ecosystem that you think will be, will be powerful for, for you and the patients you are seeing. So I think that um, definitely uh, we plan very soon to have a series of sessions to both identify um, what type of information you would like to see 
and discuss the variety of solutions that exist to present to you how these machine learning methods are, have learned and what they have learned. So the, the, the whole area of machine learning interpretability and explainability as well as trustworthiness is very much evolving and it is a, at the core of machine learning development. But what you may need in medicine may be different given the complexity of medicine than other areas in machine learning. So again, I would propose to have a series of sessions where we are identifying together for the sake of the machine learning community, but also maybe for engaging your own community to understand what would be needed from machine learning to have tools that are truly trustworthy for you. What do you need beyond just validation? What type of explainability and interpretation would be needed? And also one thing that you said in the conversation with us that I like a lot, and I think that would be an interesting subject for a conversation, would be are these tools also maybe an education tool? Could these tools be co-evolving with the clinician's understanding? Because as the understanding of the clinician about the tools evolves, maybe the tools will need to further step it up and, and make sure that this ecosystem actually is empowering. So thank you for that. I think we, we should have some engagement sessions and some sessions about that just to discuss what you all need. Okay, um, so uh, next questioner is um, Jazz actually. And Jazz, I think you're another one who you kind of had a couple questions or points um, which were all very good, but if you wouldn't mind just picking one of these, uh, that would be very helpful. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nick, and thanks, Mahela, for the, the great kind of setup here. My question was really around kind of kind of following on the theme of clinician involvement and to the extent of patient involvement as well. At what level do you think clinicians should actually be able to understand the model that they're actually being asked to base, being used to kind of base clinical decisions off of? Hank mentioned like a little pop-up comes up of somebody is noted to have atrial fibrillation and maybe they should take this medication, for example. So at what level do you think clinicians need to actually understand what's going into the black box rather than just act on the little pop-up that just magically seems to appear? And kind of a follow-on from that would be at what level do we engage patients in that as well? So, so thank you, Jess, for that question. I think that question is to, to some extent to you all in the sense that I think we, the machine learners, are the, hopefully the enablers for you and your vision. So I, I think you as a community may have different needs and different desires of understanding certain things. I personally believe that it will be good if you understand a lot about the tool, because that will help us improve the tool, both its accuracy as well as its usefulness. Also, I saw a lot of discussion in the chat about um, patients. I do think that a subset of this information should be possible uh, to be presented to the patient because given the shared decision making that clinicians and patients need to make, hopefully we can develop tools that could be informative for the patient as well, since these are choices, definitely if there is about medication that they or treatments that they will need to be involved and in, it would be nice if they understand the risks. So, uh, or, or so, so I, I would say, again, what I really hope to involve many of you is in a conversation to outline and identify what will be needed from a machine learning to provide you the right tools, the clinicians, and then also identify what do you think the patients will need to see as a subset of this and what additional tools may be needed just for the sake of the patient. So, however, it is again my hope that this is possible because uh, let us be honest, we have a lot of recommendation systems in other areas of our life, which we are using regularly. So hopefully if we can work together uh, in identifying and developing the, the, the mandate of what these tools need to provide, hopefully we can, we can build these tools together with you and how much of it may be needed for a particular clinician may depend on that clinician. So that's the reason I kind of feel not on one size fits all, but rather different types of tools with different levels of interpretability and different types of interpretability depending on the interest of the clinician and the need. But of course, with complete validation behind it. 
So hopefully we can develop this as a partnership. All right. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry to talk over you there. Um, so next up, um, this I believe this was kind of semi question, semi comment. So sorry if it's a surprise to you, but um, Henk, uh, would you like to um, share the uh, comment or question that you posted into the chat? If that's okay, I think Mihaila wanted to answer it. Yeah, yeah I, can, I suppose so. Yeah, one of the problems we uh, we have met in discussing uh, machine learning with uh, with general practitioners is that they are afraid that um, the the machine, uh, the computer, will tell them how to uh, to act and what to do, without they knowing why the machine uh, gives a, 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 a recommendations like uh, like that. And um, when I looked at our first uh, analysis that we, we have done last year, uh, I must admit that it's quite difficult to uh, to make something out of the uh, out of the, the stuff that comes up when you when you try to predict uh, diseases, because I don't understand uh, what what is in the black box which the machine uses for the prediction. We as clinicians are used to thinking ca causality, and of course this is not causality. But that's not the way clinicians think. So that was the point I tried to make, that if clinicians do not know why a machine tells them, uh, uh, tell, tell, why, why a machine tells them how to act, when they don't understand that, then they will not act conformly. So, so hey, sorry for the language, uh, Michaela. <laughs> no, 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 we are all unfortunately uh, not native English speakers. So, so I also apologize to you all for that. So, so, so I, again, I think, Hank, what I really hope as a partnership with a group of clinicians that's involved in these sessions is to present current ways. So, the, the whole area of machine learning interpretability and explainability has made huge strides in the last couple of years. I'm not saying we are there, but we are further. Mm -hmm. So given that, I think what would be very useful is to present to you what has been, let's say, accomplished so far, categorize the various ways in which we can do interpretability, where there is understanding what features are important, what features are important over time, potentially even building causal graphs that machine learning methods learn, as well as understanding predictions for similar patients. Does the machine learning predict that these patients are going to behave similarly and why? Th these are just a few examples, but what I would like to propose to all of you is to build, let's say, a few sessions just by identifying, explaining what is possible today and identifying what you like, what you do not like, what you think needs to be developed. Mm -hmm. This would be a fantastic research agenda for machine learners like me interested in healthcare and interested in empowering you. Then we understand what we have done well, what we need to do next. But also I think it will be useful for you to know what is possible today, especially in the last one or two years, a lot of again, strides on this. So it would be nice to present to you what has been done. And also I'm a big believer that maybe again, personalized explanations are useful as well because we have done a study two years ago at the University of Oxford with, uh, we've done it in Oxford, but we had um, 30 clinicians throughout the globe uh, practicing cardiovascular disease in dif uh, looking at cardiovascular disease in different ways. And what we discovered is that these 30 clinicians, each one of them had different desires in terms of what they wanted to understand. So I think the need for interpretability is there, but also the need for personalization of this interpretability, since each one of you has a mental map of how you, when you practice medicine, so you may have different questions to the machine learning model. So maybe we can expose this differently to different clinicians while presenting what other clinicians find interesting and important about the model as a backup. So hopefully okay. I can have many of you involved in these sessions. Um, and I'm about to make a sort of similar request to um, Alexander Gims and Alex. I, I think um, you sort of made a comment that was, it wasn't quite a question, but Mihaila found it very interesting. It was on bias. Um, would you mind uh, kind of expanding on that a little bit? 
Yes, thanks. So I think this was really just a reflection on the fact that many of the decision support tools that people have used in the past are, in a sense, looking at clinicians as a population. And just in the same way, we are moving with decision support tools from a population-based approach where small changes may have a big impact across the population towards precision medicine. I think in the future, what we will have to be moving to is decision support tools that don't just work for all doctors, but are individualized to the particular clinician with their particular biases who's making that decision. By personalizing the decision support tools, I think you will increase the trust that clinicians will have for those tools. So, so thank you, Alex, for this. So based on the research I have done so far with clinicians, I could not agree more. So this is why I think identifying a, a big set of tools to explain these machine learning methods in different ways and be debugged in different ways by you will be very important. So I, I think that AI itself is good at building personalized support systems. We see that in other areas, and I think it will be very useful to have it here. And this is, again, not only because of the clinicians being different and having different type of inquiring minds, but also because maybe the patient they see are different, and hence the type of explanations they need to provide to their patients may be different as well. So I think that I really hope to have all of you as partners in developing really both the, the agenda and, and evaluating the tools we have so far. Nick, I think Tom has come yes. to return to the he call. Yes, he has reappeared, so. um, exactly. Um, so, Thomas, if you could um, unmute yourself and ask your question, that would be fantastic. And I think this will probably be our last one. Uh, thanks for that. Sorry, I had a child to go and pick up from the school bus. Um, so uh, I'm not sure which question you want to ask, but I, I think my point was really about um, a question really about um, implementation science you know, I think we all accept that machine learning has the potential to transform healthcare but uh, it's a tool like any other tool um, and all tools clinicians expect to be uh, adequately assessed in the real world um, and so uh, how do you propose to engage with implementation science uh, in order to prove that uh, machine learning prediction tools really have the uh, the impact in in the real world uh, that we hope and expect they will, rather than having unintended consequences of changing us um, weak humans' behaviour in other ways. So, uh, yeah, that's my question. How do you plan to uh, uh, to engage with the sort of more human aspect of the implementation of machine learning tools? Thanks. So, so thank you, Tom, for this question. So, I, I think there are multiple parts there. One is indeed about, again, interpretability, explainability, and building tools that are truly hopefully useful for the clinician. And that is something that I think will be nice to develop together as in a partnership with, with you all to, to identify what would be useful. But then more on the pure implementation side, I think what it is useful is to to really shape the, the agenda of both research, but indirectly of development. Because what we see today as being developed is at times coming either from, um, let's say companies that have a particular niche, but they don't take full, um, they don't take advantage and don't leverage the full potential of machine learning. So part of these engagement sessions is to try to present to you new technology and try to assess it and co-develop it with you. Number two is, I think, doing simple demonstrations and showing what is possible, hopefully will lead to others considering and implementing some of this. So hopefully this will be food for thought for, for, for many others around the globe to, to, to think about solutions that could be implemented. So I really hope you all stay with us and help co-develop these this tools and these ideas. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. I think it's uh, important. So yeah, thank you. Okay, well, um, I think we're just a little bit um, over schedule at this point. So I'd like to wrap up, but just before I do, um, I'd like to introduce what you can expect from our next session, which will be on December 16th at 4 p.m. 
Um, so same time as this session. And our focus will be kind of getting a little bit more specific than the fairly high level and broad conversations we've had so far. So we'll be looking at dynamic trajectories and forecasting in the hospital. Um, the format will be relatively similar in that we'll have a presentation and this presentation will include videos as well as hopefully a tech demonstration. And then we'll go into an open Q&A for you to give your reactions and for us to discuss what you've just seen. Um, in the meantime, please do stay up to date with uh, these sessions by visiting our dedicated page for revolutionizing healthcare or looking at our emails. Um, and feel free, obviously, to get in touch with your feedback and thoughts or visit our website to find out, um, you know, basically more broadly what our, our lab is up to. And please do um, share this uh, session or this series with your friends and colleagues, uh, because we are very keen to build a community and build the resources to support that community. And just on a final note, um, I'd like to thank the six clinicians who gave their time to uh, talk to us in these kind of pre-discussions that helped shape the framework we introduced today. Um, thank you very much for your insight and for your thoughts. Also, thanks very much to our participants for joining us and to everyone who asked questions and shared their feedback, opinions, and ideas. Um, I guess I'll see you in uh, December. In the meantime, please take care, stay safe, and all the best.